back. Uh, okay, folks, uh, we have a esteemed panel with us. I, I guess we should start with a quick introduction so that you know everyone knows uh, the context we are speaking with. And uh, Bebop, should we start with you? Sorry, I caught you in the middle of. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Uh, yeah, my name is Bebop. I handle uh, marketing at Cashflow Payments. Uh, we are a payment aggregator. Uh, Power most of the startups in the payments uh, space today. Lovely, thank you, Rahul. Uh, Rahul, over to you. Hi, my name is Rahul, Rahul Karthikeyan. Um, I lead the marketing business for, I think I just, uh, the definition, I just want to change the definition. Um, I have an intern in marketing. I think that's what we follow in our organizations as well. Um, we don't really follow the titles, it doesn't matter to us, but uh, we want to be staying humble. So I lead the entire for the scale of business, it's an edtech company. Uh, we are maybe three, four years old now. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Prashant Dhar. I'm director of marketing with AO Smith. So we are into manufacturing of water purifiers and geysers. We have been operating in India for the last 15 years now. So. publishing house and uh, I take care of four brands uh, of course the flagship brand the Hindu I'm sure like most of you are aware and uh, must be loyal readers uh, then business lines sports star and frontline thank you good afternoon everyone I am Ankur I take care of marketing at TTK prestige limited it's India's largest kitchen appliances brand so all we do is talk about food and anything to do with food Lovely, lovely. And you had me at food, uh, but uh, you know, we are here to talk about something about marketing, right? Uh, so folks, uh, I, I guess in the last pre uh, panel discussion, the panel already towards the end touched upon it, but we will uh, sort of hopefully go deeper, uh, also requesting the panel to share examples, anecdotes, because, you know, to make it very real for our audience. Uh, but folks, what we are essentially talking about is how does one approach this whole personalization game uh, when we talk about uh, omni-channel marketing, right? And we'll, we'll start from the very top, uh, you know, uh, Prashant, in your opinion, you know, what does this personalization mean in, in the context of omni-channel and do you think it is important, not important, is it, it is, are its claims exaggerated, what's your opinion on it? It's, uh, it's basically creating a consistent and uniform and personalized experience for the consumers. That is what personalization is all about. Uh, it helps you to improve your matrices in terms of cost per engagement, in terms of your cost per clicks, click through rates, etc. And it all basically uh, culminates from a very clear segmentation that you do, right, for the consumers. So uh, creating very distinct consumer profiles and then targeting them in terms of you know the communication that you're doing in terms of the service delivery that you are doing so that you get the you first of all deliver what is required for the consumer and also get a better ROI I think in a very plain simple word this is what personalization to me is. Got it. And Rahul, uh, how do you resonate with this whole concept of personalization? See, there's a very thin line on personalization, okay? It can, sometimes it can get creepy as well. Uh, I'll tell you a simple definition of why is it creepy as well. Some, uh, most of the times it is useful. Um, now imagine a scenario where you're just landed onto a website, okay? You're just browsing it. You've not given a consent. And now, in India, we, it's not highly regulated. We do remarket. I mean, the moment you've kind of landed onto certain pages, and you'll see that banner everywhere. Wherever you go, <laughs> the brands will follow. It's a very creepy way of kind of, you know, doing personalizations and because you don't have a user consent there. So for me, that's a very, very thin line uh, in terms of what is very, very useful and what is a creepy. As a brand, we want to kind of stay towards the useful side of it, but though we sometimes falter on the creepy side as well. Uh, but that for me is personalization, you know, where you understand at what stage the brand is, the consumers are looking for that particular brand and want to engage with that particular that is personalization uh, from my point of view. Fair enough. And Ankur, because you folks run such a such a heavy offline business, uh, 
How do you as a company or a brand even achieve this? Is it? Okay. So uh, personalization is not a new term in the in marketing or for organizations. I mean, from the time companies have started selling products, personalization has been present in one form or the other. Okay. Now from the olden days when people used to go to the stores and engrave their names, the storekeepers and they have cherished that, they have given that as stories in that time to their uh, kids going to other homes to now when people are going to online spaces to stores which are present offline and through some mediums are being part of Omni Channel. Personalization is here to stay, it has always been. So for us it's very very important because consumer at whatever stage of journey he is engaging with the brand has to feel that he is wanted, he is valued for and whatever is invested in the brand stays with him. Now I gave you an example in form of what engraving is to mean at that point in time. Today once the consumer has bought our product, let us say in offline space or in online, and online happens to be a important space for us today, it's a substantial part of the percentage of business that we do today. Because consumers are searching online, right? It's not if I, as a consumer, see a product in an offline space, the first habit that I would want to do is go and check at least prices online. It's not only stocks at pricing; it goes to reviews, it goes to the genuinity of the product, and then see if the brand stories that the consumers are speaking are true and genuine to what the storekeeper is telling him. So for us, it's very, very critical. Post-purchase behavior are again as a brand engaging with them. Example, if I'm selling a kitchen appliances, talking to him about some recipes, post-purchase, telling him when the upgrades are supposed to happen, telling him what goes well with that product, he feels wanted, right? So it's very, very critical for us as well. All right, very interesting. Um, and Aprajita, you yourself run a, such a strong legacy brand, right? And everyone, everyone knows what to expect from this brand and you know because it has been there standing strong for so many decades now but tell me how do you now leverage such a strong legacy brand along with the power of data analytics or or machine learning to sort of create this personalized messaging but still resonating with that mother sort of brand uh, that you have okay thanks uh, so uh, see uh, we are into business and we have a moral responsibility to uh, show the significant and important news to you. Uh, it might not, I mean you might not like it but what's happening in Manipur you must know it. So there are these must to know news where we still have uh, edit intervention and we believe that it will always remain so. Uh, however, the entire personalization we are doing uh, in terms of say the good to know news which is basically news of interest uh, where we are using uh, data analytics and machine learning to create localized segments and then we are uh, you know giving providing the right uh, content to the right uh, audience but of course uh, you know uh, every day uh, we are uh, developing our data capabilities and uh, you know right now we are feeding machine and uh, there are a lot many projects uh, that are uh, in the stage of experimentation okay uh, wherever let me come to you uh, payments is such a sensitive such a uh, a, a space, a vertical wherein trust is of utmost importance, right? And whenever we talk about personalization, of course, uh, there is that data signals that you would want to ideally leverage. And given a payments company like yours has so much of data signals, tell me what are some of the ethical concerns about this whole personalization, you know, on be it on privacy uh, or risk of creating, you know, these filter bubbles? What are your thoughts on it? So yeah, no, I think uh, as a brand, we are very responsible in you know, uh, uh, how do you look at data and what are the data points on which you want to make your decision making. But as a uh, payments uh, company, we craft experiences which help our businesses offer personalization to uh, their customers. So, uh, you know, uh, for example, every time you're making a purchase, if I already know what is the address where this is going to be shipped at? And I can give that as a 
as a capability. I see that my merchants can uh, see a conversion rate that is increase that could increase by up to forty percent. So as a business, we we are we are building capabilities of you know uh, allowing our merchants to offer personalization to their customers, and that's something that uh, you know has worked for us. But uh, apart from that, we look at data. Uh, we we have you know risk engines to to prevent. Uh, you know, um, uh, to to read the signals which can help prevent you know, frauds and stuff like that. So that's something that we are working on. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Rahul. Uh, you know, as an tech company, uh, at least I'm keen to know how do you balance this whole thing of automation versus human interaction in a omni-channel environment, right? So back in the day, you would walk into the store to buy a product or a service. Uh, this would be a store which is near your house or your office. Uh, you would possibly know the person there, and you know there's that inherent trust. But in today's omni-channel experience, if you're selling an education service or a product, uh, what's this balance of automation versus versus human human touch? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, it's it's, it's pretty difficult uh, in today's world. Even now, we, I want to. I mean, I'm talking from a student point of view as well. I still want to interact physically with, with an individual sitting on the other side um, and want to know more about the product, right? So that that is still exist. Now, in some way, both automations and personalization have to play together. Uh, what we try to do is, see from a personalization point of view, uh, I'll give you a scenario in terms of where things can go wrong and things can go right as well. Uh, I'm sure most of you uh, must have had an experience wherein a random person's name would have come to your inbox saying that thank you, you kind of subscribe for this product, um, you know, and we would like to you to renew this, right? So you probably have that experience. You must have tried interacting with a salesperson whenever you get to. So you say, hey, listen, uh, I'm getting a very long information. Uh, this is not the individual I'm on that you're you know sending out emails. Can you please stop it? Today's it is very difficult, and that's where automation becomes a big problem statement, right? So. Forget about personalization, automation journeys when a brand is pulling off. You need to be very sacrosanct in terms of how these automations are being built, uh, you know, and you need to ensure that you know user consent is always taken and it is rightly attributed to to the persona as well. So, for me, that's that's automation part of it. Yes, if you solve for that. Um, next, from a personalization point of view, yes, a salesperson they want to kind of interact with a human figure. Uh, it can be one of the co-founders or we have our own sales representatives as well. Um, but the initial nudge from their side, if there is a small message as a WhatsApp particular conversation coming from their side, which has an individual's name and probably you know, asking for a certain time, if there is sort of a empathy given to the lead, to the, to the consumer, I feel that in, in many ways that personalization can be built and I think a uh, lot of our TG is now becoming digitally accepted and they're accepting the digital nature of conversations now. We don't really step out to you know, interact with a, with a stranger. We interact in a digital ecosystem these days. Um, so I think in some way the communication and automation has to play together. Otherwise it can, be, it can lead to a disaster, but in many ways it, it does lead to better efficiencies as well. And from, a, from an organization point of view, um, it is a lot of savings. It is like you, a person is not really traveling to, a, to an A to B as well. Um, from a business point of view, it makes more business sense as well, you know, if we can automate a lot of these processes. Yeah, yeah. And Vishal, any examples from from your current or, or maybe earlier in your career? Yeah, so uh, what I believe is that uh, between automation and personal intervention, there should be a there should be a defined line, right? Because sometimes when your need is, uh, uh, say, some, say for example, in our category, if uh, someone is coming onto our website and asking for a product, or you know wants wants to know a little bit more about certain products, features, etc., which can be easily automated through a chatbot or something like that, right? But when he is in extreme winters, when he is having a product fault, right? He is going to kill me if my chatbot keeps on interacting with him. So at that time, you need to shift him back to the to your customer care where you do need a human intervention. So there's a fine balance between the two that you need to have. It's a blurred line, but it needs to be defined sharply. 
so that you know uh, the scalability as well as the personalization or the empathy both mix uh, uh, have the right balance. Yeah, I love it. Empathy uh, when during winters <laughs> it can be critical. Uh, but uh, Angkur, any thoughts? Yeah. So uh, today, I think most of the people who are here, uh, and a lot of us here as marketers and organizations, today getting customer data in the omni-channel uh, platform it's not difficult. Okay, because all of us are in the digital space, and more and more as the adoption is going up, the data coming in into the system is not an issue. Most of the marketers in the country today are, at least few of them whom I know, are struggling to understand what to do with the data. Okay, we are talking jargons, we are talking, yes, generative AI is coming in, we are saying that yes, personalization should happen. But to what extent, to what measures, and if at all we should be doing it for the consumers because we are now getting slowly but surely getting into the irritating space of the customers. So making that balance good enough where he that is leisure space where he is wanting to interact with you and if he or she is wanting to come to the brand and then the brand is talking to them is something that will as going forward would make more sense to the brands than brands trying to reach out to them again and again and again and making that space getting disappeared in the next decade or so. I mean, the sooner it's getting created, it may get disappeared as well. I mean, that threat is over. Yeah, I'm almost reminded of this uh, aligners company who I, uh, I went to their website and uh, in hindsight, it was a big mistake. Uh, I put in my phone number and uh, this was for my son who was 11 then. Uh, and this gentleman calls me within two hours. Again, uh, the power of how fast we reach the customers, right? And he told me that, you know, sir, the, this is idly be suggested at the age of 13 years and above. I said, thank you very much. And I thought uh, the lead is now closed. And for the next three months, every day, twice a day, morning and evening, I used to get call from this company saying that, you know, are you interested in aligners? And I used to tell them that, you know, this is, this is what you folks told me. So, of course, my son is. And this kept happening for a good three months until I had to write an email to the founder saying, Please excuse me, I'm, I'm almost willing to pay the cost of the liners if you stop calling me. So, uh, you know, yeah, finally it stopped. The, the, you know, I don't think for everyone reaching out to founders on LinkedIn, this should be the way, right? So, okay, uh, let's, let's talk about some of the uncomfortable topics, right? So, measurement in this entire Omni channel, measurement in this entire uh, personalization space. What's your view on it? How does one measure? Uh, isn't attribution a problem? How do you know if your bank or buck is coming and is it coming from this channel and hence you should invest more there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, see, uh, one of the biggest challenges most, uh, and I'm speaking for many categories uh, here, uh, is it that attribution, that word attribution, okay, it is, it's, it's pretty really difficult uh, to kind of be as accurate as possible to get the attribution number figures correct. Okay, so, uh, the most important piece is to get your data infrastructure at the back end pretty strong. Uh, there are very few companies, I'm, I think maybe gaming and, and a couple of other places, players have been phenomenal, e-commerce uh, are phenomenal, I think they've kind of advanced themselves. Uh, but there are many other categories where they, probably there is still a lot more work to be done. Uh, so it all boils down to the kind of data infrastructure that we have built. Um, basis that in some way if you are able to articulate how the attribution is. Now, for example, now uh, when I am talking to my founders, right, it's, it's very blatant, it's very blind. Uh, Facebook is not working now, Google is working, let's just pause it. But it's a very long way of looking at Facebook as a channel. Uh, and we did one experiment. We just kind of paused Facebook for, for eight days. Yeah. Uh, there was a direct impact in terms of the organic flow, in terms of the Google search volumes dropping as well. So there is dependency on all the source. What is important is what sort of dependency and how much can I bring in more efficiency on that. Now that level of data, I mean, it's, there, is, there are very few brands who are able to succeed. Unfortunately, I, think, I don't think even Scaler has done that. Yes, and I'm pretty open about it. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done there. Uh, 
but still our data engineers are constantly at it to ensure that the entire data infrastructure is stable and it comes from one single source. Right? So, uh, and we don't really depend on any external factors. Everything is all stored inside. Right? So that becomes a very big challenge. Now, after that comes the metrics. Because then, if you know that infrastructure is all in some way stored, your metrics then becomes uh, everything. It depends on, like, for example, if I have to do brand campaign, uh, my metric will as simple be what sort of uh, traffic visits, incremental traffic, uh, what sort of click-throughs, what sort of engagements have to build. But if it comes to performance, it'll be more towards uh, you know conversions and um, ROAS as well. Right? So, uh, but again, that it has to go back to how well built your infrastructure is. Uh, otherwise, your definition might be wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I think uh, I wanted to actually share an you know, example of what we did at Cashfree uh, a couple of years back. Uh, we 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 were doing you know email cold outreaches and we really wanted to test. If we go to the extent of personalizing it to the T, how good our results are going to be. So we went first by you know, line of business perspective and we did a campaign. We saw an incremental uh, result. Then we said, you know what, uh, the, the, the incremental output is so much that let's actually stop everything, write emails where every email has an insight about that organization. And when we did that, <coughs> our results were phenomenal. Of course, it's a function of you know how much time and bandwidth and resource you have so that you can replicate this at scale. But I think with you know AI coming in and generative AI being there, your ability to write uh, better uh, content, uh, your uh, ability to use tools like AMP, etc., your uh, your ability to personalize your message to, to to the customer and the audience of one that is today and, and like every experiment we have done, we've seen like incremental. Benefits. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I said, that uh, right now we are doing personalization in pockets, and uh, what we have seen is uh, that you know, by, uh, by using data analytics and machine learning, uh, we created these lookalike uh, segments for our subscribers and today um, uh, our internal data shows that our subscribers are 25 times uh, more engaged than the non-subscribers so that's uh, something uh, really great and second is we have been able to um, uh, do better targeting for our uh, advertisers and of course like we have repeat clients coming back to our uh, you know business and site so uh, for the business of course it's uh, good and for the bottom line as well yeah. attribution again nothing tastes better than the money which flows into the bank <laughs> i mean but like we are saying it's omni channel right the customer is looking for the product in one platform buying from another giving reviews on the third and then putting complaints about the product after usage on the fourth. So it's extremely what we have metrics to define that okay, this is the cost of acquisition, this is the ROAS, and all that metrics that we follow. But attributing to one platform, one type of activity is extremely, extremely difficult. The marketing universe, at least in the country, have not matured enough to attribute sales to an exact activity that can happen in the omni-channel experience. If I do it for a particular channel, towards a concentrated effort, I can say this activity led me to this particular result. But that's very tactical, that's short term, because over a period of time, consumers are not staying on one platform, right? And they're moving across. Brands have to move across with them. Like most of them told you, attribution is a pain at this point in time. Let me accept it. Most of you will accept here that it's exactly a pain, but yes, there are metrics which are slowly evolving. And as we go forward, I believe that yes, something yeah. better will happen. Branko, there are customers who write back to you. They are custom you know that where the customer is going today. Either for engagement or for purchase or for making decisions. So wherever he is going or she is going, we follow them. Now there are enough data points with us through the data scientists, through the metrics that we are following, we know where the customer is going. We as a brand try to follow them and be present wherever they are. It may convert today, it may convert tomorrow, 
but if as a brand we follow customers and are with them okay over a period of time there is no way that the customer is looking somewhere else fair enough fair enough okay uh, we'll we'll touch upon one last topic and then we'll open it up for q and a so uh, folks out there can think of the question they would want to ask the panelists uh, again across the panel uh, what are some of the emerging technology or trends do you most resonate with when you think about omni channel or when you think about personalization today uh, i'll give you uh, an example which we are for which we are right now following uh, there's something called ai right that we are using now it's it's about personalization so uh, we have created uh, modules on our uh, web page wherein actually the consumer can go and visualize each and every of our product in their own space so that's that gives a, a you know an elevated level of uh, consumer experience to him because across 60 70 skus if you are getting you know to test different types of uh, uh, you know products or colors or color combinations in your own kitchen space or a bathroom bathroom space and then take a decision to purchase or not so that is you know one way in which it is obviously uh, uh, you know moving forward apart from that obviously there are things like uh, uh, you know your chatbots and stuff like that which are machine chat chatbots as they say which which uh, which we have to you know really exploit which we are using but we are not exploiting it uh, you know yeah like that using but not exploiting ever what do you think <laughs> i just wanted to make it a little bit more controversial uh you know there is a big debate that chat gpt is like a boon for writing content and as marketers uh, you know uh, maybe it's time for us to start putting a disclaimer that this is been written by chat gpt that sort of gives the ownership of you know of the of that piece of content what do you guys think about that <laughs> yeah seems like level within the level Uh, so i think right now uh, with this a- entire data analytics uh, we have been uh, you know able to uh, pick data across the channels and especially if i'm talking uh, from a, a publishing perspective see while uh, the reader can you know casually switch between newspaper to app to a website social media still the channels are different but what we have done is like we could pick data from various channel and integrate them to uh, create look alike segments and we have seen uh, early success in terms of you know better uh, engaged consumers and i think uh, in future uh, uh, you know we will be able to have better predictions and better uh, segmentation and uh, as you know uh, you will know harari said that the extreme uh, eminent change in terms of extreme personalization would be uh, from intimacy and i think uh, then uh, all all of us all the marketers have to come up with some radical approach lovely we are down to the cpns now okay uh, i'm going to uh, closing thoughts on on this on the tools that you think are the trends yeah so uh, one point because we started by saying we are offline heavy right so the patience to the customers is not there the retail space is becoming more and more expensive so there's one thing there are a lot of things which are coming up in that space because the patience of the consumers are going there's something like endless i i don't know how many of you here know okay so now all the stores did not keep the stock that they have they can customers walk in they have the virtual experience of the product and they can order from that store itself the cost of storing the cost of doing business would come down customers don't have to wait for it that's one okay and then in the omni channel space the challenge for the brand is to make yourself available wherever they are so that's one thing that we continue to strive and make ourselves in the future capable of example website okay is something we are actually wanting in a, in a journey to make ourselves make it better in terms of that okay which is your turn around with the customer serviceability and making custom because the customer is not ready to wait for 7 days for a product how many of us are today 
willing to buy a product which will come on seven days or eight days, which was true just before COVID. So we are also in that space where we are trying to make the products available to the customer within 24 hours, 48 hours. That's what the omni-channel experience for the customers going forward would uh, enable the brand to be more competitive. Lovely. We now open it up to the audience. Uh, any of you have a question for our panelists? Okay, this can mean two things. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, we'll close it here. Thank you so much, folks. Uh, it was lovely hearing you. And uh, thank you for taking our time.